Welcome to the December 2019 episode of Core Safety TV, brought to you directly from the National Mining Association. This month, we're going to talk about the importance of using air respirators in mining operations, most specifically about how they are certified for use by the National Personal Protective Technology Laboratory, NPPTL. The NPPTL is a research center within the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, that conducts research on personal protective equipment and technologies. Back in 1919, the U.S. Bureau of Mines launched the first respirator certification program. And then just a few months later, on January 15, 1920, the USBM actually certified the first respirator. So it's been exactly 100 years since all of that took place. Now, just a few months ago, in September 2019, NIOSH and NPPTL decided to celebrate that milestone with the first annual Respiratory Protection Week. Now, to learn more about all of this, I'd like to introduce you to Mary Ann D'Alessandro and Bob Stein from NPPTL. Mary Ann and Bob, thank you for joining us on Core Safety TV. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, Nelson. Can you start by telling us a little more about the work that takes place at NPPTL? Sure, Nelson. Uh, the mission of the National Personal Protective Technology Laboratory is to advance the state of knowledge and application of personal protective technologies. Essentially, what this means in occupational safety and health is that we conduct the research that leads to the standards for personal protective equipment and ultimately re respirators that are approved uh, using those standards. And then once those respirators are approved, we also have post-market evaluation and then uh, interventions and outreach and guidance is developed. So Mary Ann, tell us about the 100 year anniversary that you just recently recognized. The week of September 5th was Respiratory Protection Week. In the past, we had that as N95 day, um, indicating an N95 respirator, so 9-5 on September 5th. So we expanded that this year in honor of the 100 years to include all respirators in Respiratory Protection Week. That kickoff um, included social media, posting of um, information for uh, the public safety sector and healthcare sector primarily, uh, with some information for mining. And then as we move into the anniversary of the first respirator approval, which was approved in, on January 15, 1920, um, at that time we were going to have a regional celebration where we are inviting regional stakeholders from around the area within about a 50 mile radius to celebrate with us and honor the workers who use respiratory protection and also the researchers and scientists who are actually involved in conducting the research leading to the standards and approving the devices. Bob, let me ask you what's involved in approving and certifying an air respirator that would be used in mining operations. A thumbnail sketch uh, would be that we do an engineering analysis of the design. Uh, we evaluate the manufacturer's quality assurance process. Uh, once we get all the records collected, uh, we uh, also do testing of the respirator. Uh, we have samples that are sent in and run through a number of different tests. Uh, we compile all that information, and assuming that it has succeeded, we are able to grant an approval uh, to the respirator. The mining types of respirators, the ones that we have in front of us, uh, are also co-approved by MSHA, so the uh, evaluation project is shared with them. They get a chance to look at all the information that we're looking at, and then the decision to go forward with the approval is a joint decision, and uh, the approval is a joint approval. So Bob, for someone who hasn't actually been in a laboratory like yours, how do you actually go about testing the respirators? For many, many years, the only way we had to evaluate them uh, for the entire performance of the respirator was with the help of uh, human volunteers. Uh, who would uh, go through a series of exercises wearing the respirators and the respirator performance could be monitored while they were doing this. It's a controlled set of exercises. So a lot of the work we do here at the lab is to advance the technology of how we test the respirators. And it was a, a multi-year project to come up with a machine uh, that can do a lot of the same things that people do. Uh, we call it a metabolic simulator. 
and it uh, breathes and uh, it's able to exercise the respirators much the same way a person does. So a lot of the testing, we shifted over to the machine. We still uh, use the help of, of human subjects. Uh, ultimately, it's people who are going to wear these and we wanna make sure they work when they are worn by people. And so the uh, approval analysis always contains at least a few tests where uh, human volunteers are wearing them. So now let's talk a little bit about the history of air respirators. What are the biggest changes that you've seen? Well, I guess the most important thing to talk about now is the change that happened in 2012. And that was when the closed circuit escape respirator standard was put in place in April 2012. And that was a standard that resulted in new improvements to those escape respirators that are used in underground mines. There were a few technological advancements that were now required and had to be evaluated by us. And the intent is that you would be able to have some sensors in these systems that will tell you if uh, the units had been exposed to um, humidity or, ex or if the, the sensors that show that whether or not the system continues, would continue to perform as it was certified. And then also more ruggedization with these units as well. But that ruggedization also has resulted in larger units. And you could see this is one of the units from the old prior to the standard in 2012. And this is a unit after the standard in 2012. So it's a larger size, but has about the same capability. Are the air respirators that miners use today heavier or lighter than they once were? It depends on the design, Nelson. Uh, some of the designs, here, here are two that are from the same manufacturer, one that was approved prior to the uh, change in the standard and one that was approved after. And you can see just by looking at them, they're very, very similar, practically uh, indistinguishable. And so a lot of it had to do with the technology that was originally employed uh, in order for the manufacturer to provide those cues for the miners to have to look at the unit and decide whether or not it's in good shape uh, to continue to carry it and use it in the event of an emergency. Uh, some of the uh, technology had to change more drastically than others. What significant technological changes have you seen over the last decade or so? Well, in 2011, uh, the mining uh, group at NIOSH took on some work to conduct some component evaluations and develop some components that would be able to be used in next generation escape respirators under the new standard that was published in 2012. That work resulted in um, reduced size cylinders, the higher pressure cylinders that could possibly be integrated in future systems and provide um, additional longer life for those systems. Also it resulted in some dockable and switchover valves that could result in a unit being switched over from one to the other. So the wearer would not lose air when they were switching over from one unit. Now they have to hold their breath when they go to the next unit. And then also an additional, a new face piece design was developed as well and to, for potentially being integrated in another system. So all of these components were done by leaders in the field with the intent that there would be a systems integrator putting them all together into a platform, which at that time was a backpack platform. What happened though was this project went through a peer review, had excellent scientific reviews, but a decision was made to terminate that work and terminate the integration of it from an internal standpoint and let the manufacturers conduct that integration. So regarding any innovations on the horizon? What we have seen through the approval of the new closed circuit escape respirator standard is that the manufacturers are developing their technologies to meet the requirements, but I haven't seen anything that looked completely different from an innovation standpoint. I don't know, Bob, if you have. Just to add to what Marianne is saying, and I agree, uh, typically they will come to us when they have new technology if they have questions about whether or not uh, we think it's going to present a problem in meeting the standard. And uh, you've got to remember that we see uh, respirators that are used in a lot of different industries, 
and uh, some of the uh, activity isn't necessarily uh, in respirators that are used in mining. Uh, they're just not the uh, types of respirators that are employed on those uh, job sites, uh, but they make, um, they make some changes for uh, other respirator wearers. Uh, but um, they, they typically come to us and will ask us questions about a technology that they've come across uh, if they think uh, uh, or have a question about whether or not they're going to have a problem to meet the standard using that new technology. So how long does it take to test and approve an air respirator at NPPTL, or even just a component that might be involved? It, it requires that it be pretty mature, Nelson. Uh, the um, concept behind the standard was essentially developed around commercialized products. So it's not as, it's not as though it's a hand-holding process when you start out. And as a matter of fact, it's uh, incumbent in the whoever is coming to us with a respirator, they have to have testing evidence to show that it meets the standard, at least insofar as they're able to you know, produce that testing evidence, uh, even as they come to us to be approved. So the products that we see are typically either commercialized or very near commercialized by the time they're offered to us uh, to evaluate them for approval. And so, um, you know, the, the projects can range anywhere from, let's say, maybe three months uh, on up towards, it, it could take as long as a year for some of the more complicated projects and depending on what our workload is. All right, Marianne and Bob, this has all been so insightful for us. Is there anything else that you'd like to add for our miners today? Um, from a mining standpoint, I think it's important to remember that we continue to conduct the long-term field evaluation program where we pull out the respirators you see in front of you uh, for, uh, to evaluate them to make sure they continue to meet the requirements of the approval. Under the new standard, the, the closed circuit escape respirator standard from 2012, this is now a requirement of that regulation. In the past, it was done more of a, as a research effort, but now going forward, is, it is actually part of the regulation. Worker health and safety is foremost in our mission, and uh, we're always concerned uh, all the work that we do. Uh, we often hear requests that we can't meet. Uh, we know that um, smaller and lighter is a constant request for escape respirators. Uh, and uh, when there are things that can happen that can allow that, uh, we would, we would uh, promote those changes. Uh, in the meantime, though, again, we're looking for reliable respirators. Uh, and we will only uh, prove those that uh, meet all the requirements of the standards. Well, let me just say that we thank you again for your time today and for the important work that's done by you and other experts at NPPTL. Very much appreciate it. And that's it for now. I hope that you enjoyed that in-depth interview with Marianne D'Alessandro and Bob Stein. I'll see you here again next month, and it will be 2020, if you can believe that. Until then, whenever you're online, please be sure to keep following us on Facebook and Twitter. And watch your email for our monthly ecoms with other important mining safety information. For the National Mining Association and Core Safety, I'm Nelson Duffel. Be safe out there. Have a wonderful holiday season. And thank you for watching. To share one of your safety stories, videos, or photos, email us at info at coresafetytv.org.